One of the central questions that comes up almost inevitably and immediately in any introduction to philosophy class or anything similar to that where students are getting introduced to the vast discipline and literature of philosophy more or less for the first time. They've usually heard the word, but they're not quite sure what it is. They ask, well, what is the definition of philosophy? And it makes good sense why people want definitions. We use them as tools, as intellectual devices for demarcating what something is and what it isn't. Very often when we're teaching matters, especially outside of the field of philosophy, we give students definitions as starting points that then they can move on from. And, and we do this a lot in our primary and secondary education, things that people have to memorize. We're rewarded for learning the definitions of things and being able to regurgitate them. And so there's a few things to say about this. The first is that there is no agreed upon definition of philosophy. And when I say agreed upon, I mean one where there's consensus among all of the many practitioners, even in the present day, not to mention going backwards in time or spreading ourselves out across various intellectual cultures. So there is, there's a lot of definitions, but there's no definition singular that everybody is in agreement on. The second thing is that we actually use definitions or things like definitions, but not exactly the same uh, as, as tools in philosophy. A lot of philosophy is actually saying, what is the meaning of this? What is, what is the best thing? What is the essence? How do we express it? And so it's, it's quite natural that when somebody is starting out in philosophy, we should take that activity of seeking definitions as something we would apply to the field itself. And this brings us to the third point. In asking what is the definition of philosophy, we are engaged in what we nowadays call metaphilosophical activity and inquiry. And there's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, that can be quite a good exercise to carry out but it has not generated over the years in which people have been engaged in that, as I just mentioned, any sort of consensus definition. And it's important to recognize that you are doing philosophy in asking for the definition of philosophy. So, you know, the prospects of attaining a definition that everybody will agree to are, are actually pretty slim. There's all sorts of dodges that people do. They say, well, philosophy, if we break it down etymologically, the philo is love, literally friendship or desire for, uh, you know, fondness of. And then the sophos is, is wisdom. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. And then you can say, oh, that's, that's cool what the hell does that mean? <laughs> because that could mean a lot of different things. Do you love wisdom in the sense that you're seeking after it to personify it as some philosophical and wisdom traditions have, usually in the form of a, a woman that is being sought by the male seeker of wisdom? Do you view wisdom as a state within yourself so it's actually a reflexive activity? Is wisdom the collected uh, smart things that people have said throughout the ages so that you would be going through various texts and sayings and proverbs. Uh, one thing we can say without having to settle this right now, love of wisdom as a characterization of philosophy does not really provide us with any sort of adequate definition. And you could go to dictionaries if you want to. Um, don't rely on dictionaries. As a matter of fact, when you're doing philosophy, this is just a side note, it's never good to begin by saying the, you know, so-and-so dictionary defines this term as et cetera, et cetera, because it, usually in philosophy, we're working with a different sense of the term than simply the dictionary definition. Dictionaries only tell us their historical documents what people have meant by a term, they don't really outline the essence uh, that a term is supposed to signify. So you can find all sorts of cool dictionary definitions of philosophy. 
those are not really an adequate starting point as well. I'd like to lead you through a whole bunch of interesting proposals for defining philosophy and, and comment on a few of them so you get some idea of the vast range of ways people have looked at this activity, this literature, this discipline that they are engaged in. So from ancient philosophers, Plato at one point defines philosophy as preparation for death. Now that's kind of a startling way of understanding it, right? I mean, you might say funeral planning would be more like that than philosophy, but philosophy is early on in the West tied together with putting things into a big perspective, the end point of which is death. Aristotle, Plato's student, at one point says, the science of the universal essence of that which is actual. That's pretty abstract. Does that tell you much of anything without going into Aristotle's texts? Probably not. Epicurus, an activity which by words and arguments secures the happy life. This is focusing much more on the practical side of philosophy, philosophy as a way of life. And you could find similar statements from other philosophers like the Stoics. Um, Cicero, the science of divine things and the human causes through which all these things are contained. A much more metaphysical definition of philosophy, which refers us to the higher matters, the things that determined the universe and us as parts of that, and uh, understanding them in terms of causes. When we get to the medieval period, here's a, a few. The illumination of the intelligent mind by the pure wisdom, a kind of return and recall to it so that it seems at once the pursuit of wisdom, the pursuit of divinity, and the friendship of that pure mind. That is Boethius uh, in the Consolation of Philosophy telling us about that. There's a lot involved in that definition. Notice love, the pursuit of wisdom, pursuit of divinity, friendship of that of pure mind, several different aspects interconnected there. Dante says philosophy is a loving use of wisdom. Alkindi, the establishment of what is true and right. Moving on to early modern philosophers, Miguel de Montaigne has a single word answer, doubt. Right? Uh, Rene Descartes says the study of wisdom and by wisdom is meant not only prudence in everyday affairs, but also a perfect knowledge of the things that mankind is capable of knowing both for the conduct of life and the preservation of health and the discovery of all manner of skills. A very well worked out definition there, which, you know, you could certainly agree with, but not everybody's going to buy that one. <clears throat> Thomas Hobbes also said, the knowledge acquired by reasoning from the manner of the generation of anything to the properties or from the properties to some possible generation of the same to the end to be able to produce as far as matter and human force permit such effects as human life requires. So again, a rather practically oriented definition of philosophy, but it involves some metaphysical understanding and inquiry and analysis, learning how things are brought to be so we can make them happen like that. Later modern philosophers, uh, Georg Friedrich Wilhelm, William Friedrich Hegel says, the actual cognition of that which in truth is. Okay, so, you know, that's, that's a nice abstract phrase as well. Um, Herbert Spencer, completely unified knowledge. Now that's an interesting one because it points towards something that was there as an impulse in philosophy really from the beginning, a kind of knowledge, a kind of understanding of things that would actually provide the big picture and unify the other kinds of knowledge. William Wundt, the acquisition of such a general conception of the world and of life as will satisfy the exigencies of the reason and the needs of the heart. Exigencies are demands of reason. So Wundt is, is signifying reason. We have to satisfy reason and we also have to satisfy the needs of the heart, of our emotional side. Some definitions from analytic Anglo-American philosophers. 
G.E. Moore famously said when he was asked what's philosophy, it's what all these are about, gesturing at his bookshelf. Right? So that's not much of a, a definition, but it is at least saying, well, where do you find these, these uh, bits of philosophy? Ludwig Wittgenstein very famously called philosophy a fight against the fascination which forms of expression exert upon ourselves. He also called philosophy a disease that, uh, of which it should be the cure, right? And then finally, Rudolf Carnap, one of the logical positivists from the Vienna Circle, the logic of the sciences. Again, this, this sort of overarching project where philosophy has something to do with the other disciplines and informs them in some way. Continental European philosophers, um, Fernand von Steinbergen, the integral study of the real. Integral means comprehensive, uh, connecting everything up together. Ortega y Gasset, a science without presuppositions. This is often another aspect of philosophy that people signal, whereas all the other sciences and disciplines, they buy into something at the start with philosophy. We're supposed to attend to the realities in front of us without making presuppositions. That's the way at least some philosophers have looked at it. Um, Habermas, uh, Jürgen Habermas says, the guardian of rationality, pointing towards a task for philosophy more than a definition of philosophy. There are several others that we could take a look at that I think would be interesting. Uh, for example, American pragmatist and process philosophers, uh, Josiah Royce said, passions, faith, doubt, and courage the critical inquiry into what all these things mean and imply is philosophy. So philosophy bears upon all of these things that we often don't view as rational. William James, this is a really great definition, although great in the sense of, you know, pithy at expressing something. The unusual stubborn attempt, unusually stubborn attempt to think clearly, right? So the philosopher is like everybody else trying to think clearly but they stick to it more. And he doesn't say they stick to it more by discipline. He frames it in terms of stubbornness, right? Uh, John Dewey said, inherently criticism having its distinctive position among various modes of criticism and its generality, a criticism of criticisms as it were. Philosophy is and can be nothing but this critical operation and function become aware of itself and its implications pursued deliberately and systematically. So a lot of Critique, criticism, critique, critic, all of those elements there. And notice it's reflexive for Dewey. I also want to point out one other thing in the Dewey, right? Philosophy is and can be nothing. That phrase occurs so many times in the history of philosophy, where philosophers attempt to legislate what philosophy could be. And as it turns out, it always escapes those, those strictures. Uh, finally, uh, Alfred North Whitehead. An attitude of mind towards doctrines ignorantly entertained. Isn't that an interesting idea? We ignorantly entertain doctrines, teachings, ideas, and then we adopt an attitude of mind towards them, and that's philosophy. Um, there are three others that I thought would be kind of interesting to bring up po from poets and, and theologians. Uh, Novalis says, really homesickness, an urge to be at home everywhere. We make, through philosophizing, things that are not our home into our home. T.S. Eliot gave a kind of nonsensical one. The purple bullfinch in the lilac tree. It sounds almost, you know, zen-like, doesn't it? And then finally, Paul Tillich, the theologian, that cognitive approach to reality in which reality as such is the object. Again, a very metaphysical emphasis there, uh, getting at the reality that is only being dealt with piecemeal by the other sciences and disciplines. Now, notice all these definitions or character characterizations of philosophy, there's something to them. We can go into them. We can explain them. We can derive some benefit from them. None of them manage to apply to everything that we call philosophy. So that should lead us to be a little bit leery of demanding definitions right off the bat. Perhaps, and here's what I would suggest coming from Plato, some definitions we can begin with 
and other definitions, we have to work our way towards them. And it may not happen at the end of a week or reading of several books. It may take us a long time and we may need to revise those definitions that we generate along the way.